Hi, welcome to lesson two. Lesson two is about the designing a control survey for a bridge construction purpose. This is very simple example of what you are doing in actual works, work, so it's very complex task. So uh, the planning is a simulation of the reality. I've tried to do as close as we could, but in and we try to have a standard dimension of observation to re reflect what you need to achieve in the field. So there are a number of stages for this lesson. First of all, I'm going to the outline the criteria. So we need to understand what are the criteria we have to meet for bridge construction. Then we do the initial reconnaissance and then we do the pre-analysis of the control survey and then we uh, consider different options, how we can improve our control survey to meet the criteria. And then once we've done, obviously, we do the actual adjustment. And then the last stage would be uh, project operations and monitoring. So let's start with the first stage, which is the criteria for the bridge construction setup. First of all, uh, from what you've learned from construction, we should be able to do a kind of working survey and um, for any bridge type uh, work we need to get like 100 meter upstream and downstream if you kind of remember like a cross sections of the area which include uh, like top of the bank to top of the bank and then we have like obviously some point in the middle and then we have to also map the bed level for the river uh, 500 meters upstream and downstream. I really recommend you go and have a look at what you've learned in construction. It's a good review for this uh, lesson, but if you don't have access or uh, bad luck, so <laughs> we just listen to this uh, and hopefully it will solve uh, all of your questions. If not, ask question in the forum, please. I'm happy to answer all of your questions. So, once you've done the survey, uh, detailed survey for the area, you're going to have the generic topography from the field. Uh, you also should create the DTM for the area, and you probably need to have a map for the road designs and all the bridge elements, um, which gives you enough idea how it's going to be constructed. For bridge construction especially, we need to have the bridge control line uh, set out very precisely, both in terms of direction and distance, so there's certain criteria for that to meet. Uh, we try to get the bearing, uh, if I assume I have two control lines at each side of the bridge, which you need to have for any type of bridge control survey, we really need to have two control at each side of the bridge, which is across the river. and then. The bridge control line needs to, uh, the direction needs to be fixed. In this case, we fix that to 90 degree, and then we have to uh, basically measure that distance uh, to meet the criteria. I'm going to talk about the distance criteria in a second. Other criteria we have to meet, uh, we need to have the high precision around the uh, construction area of the road in this case and uh, bridge construction area we need to achieve the certain criteria for the coordinates of control survey we have in those area because we are setting out very uh, main elements of the road obviously and bridge from those control survey and it's very important for us to achieve the high precision so Assuming the site is near sea level, uh, we consider that our distances doesn't need to be corrected for any curvature uh, and elevation um, correction, and the grid scale assumed is 1 uh, to basically convert our GDA coordinates to uh, local grid system or local coordinates. So, after examining the specification and tolerance, uh, the critical requirement uh, for us to meet is uh, once you read all the probably criteria in the, you have been given the criteria sometimes, 
by your client or you need to go and search and see what's the standard requirement for bridge construction in Australia. Uh, like it's pretty much like road uh, main road documents that shows all the standard requirement requirement for constructing the road. There's a similar thing for the bridge that you have to read and make sure that you can achieve that. But uh, for this person, you don't need to go. I will give you what are the criteria. So assuming that you have to, I told you, bridge control lines is very important. We fix the direction to 90 degrees. Uh, or bearing to 90 degrees and then we have to get the accuracy of plus and minus 2 millimeter plus 2 ppm we know this is going to be times to the distance of that control so it varies with the distance of the control line so we need to achieve this accuracy at 95 percent in confidence but remember I always told you anything in the standards is based on 95% confidence level. So if, for example, your instrument has the accuracy of plus and minus one millimeter plus one ppm at 68% confidence level, then you have to double up this number to achieve the 95% confidence level and see whether you can uh, meet the criteria or not. And, uh, the other criteria is your control station should get the coordinates of plus and minus five millimeter again at 95% confidence level. So these are our two important criteria. So when we are doing our control survey, at the end we check our result and see whether we can achieve this or not, or we have to consider different options. When you're doing uh, any pre-analysis, uh, generally uh, for the bridge construction, the critical measurement are usually north, south, and east, west. So if you can achieve uh, or meet the criteria for north, south, and east, west direction, usually uh, that will do for us. So because most of the bridge elements are either in east, west, like control line, or north, south, or uh, for other elements. So let's have a look at the example here. So I'm jumping to this slide to show you what it looks like. So we have two stations in north-south direction and these stations uh, or points are 500 meters from where I want to put my total station and set out these points. Good. Each equal uh, distances 500 meters. Our, specific, our specification is our instrument has 2 millimeter plus 3 ppm accuracy for distance measurement. Assuming we only consider the distance error, I'm not talking about angle really, obviously you have to consider that if you want to do the very good pre-analysis, but at this stage, just imagine we're considering the distance error. If I put that 500 meter in this formula, we should have agreed that it's gonna give us roughly 3.5 millimeter. But I told you I got this on from instrument specification. So whatever you have in the instrument specification, do you remember it was at 68% confidence level. If you want to get the 95%, which is the requirement for the bridge set out, we have to, for this case, it's gonna be for each of these points, I'm gonna get the accuracy of point uh, like setting out that position in plus or minus seven millimeters, double up the number basically. But this is for so for each of these points I can get seven millimeter plus or minus seven millimeter accuracy. So what would be the precision I can get for measuring the distance between these two? Simply I can say this one squared precision for this point squared plus precision for the other one squared and it gives me the precision for measuring between say A to B, the distance between the A to B. So it's going to come with uh, 14, 14, I think it's 
equal to four plus or minus five millimeter, just rounded. So you can see uh, it is good, but if you want to increase the accuracy, obviously you can measure the distance in two. If I'm measuring um, like each distance of this distance twice, or if I measure the angles face by face rise, I can increase this number uh, to have better precision. Let's move on. When you are setting out the controls, uh, usually we expect you to put the control station uh, a concrete well deep driven uh, that you make sure that is stable and it's not gonna move. So you also need to have the recovery marks for each of those control station. It can be like any points uh, nearby, it can be offset points and then you can uh, record it in your field data that okay uh, like this control can be recovered from PSM like if you know the distance and direction obviously so it's always good to have some reco recovery marks for any of the controls that you are setting out good moving on uh, the approximate position of the control station have to be chosen to allow for access and sideline and ground stability so we put our control station wherever we think that is the stable we make sure that we have side line between our station because we want to run the traverse road we also make sure that is that side is not going to be blocked during the construction uh, in most cases control for any construction type of wall control may be basic until the initial bulk walls have been finished but uh, in bridge case, the position of pylons and pile driving may require accurate uh, control from the start. So we have to make sure that we put the control survey very accurate from the start of the project to the end. You can refer to construction surveying again to find out more. But for this ex exercise, we only uh, consider 2D adjustment we haven't considered the height although height is very critical across the uh, control line uh, but uh, we imagine we do the traverse only then the height will be done by the precise level runs from the PSM plus probably few uh, points or observation across the river so is the separate process that will be done after this the control survey and adjustment analysis uh, have to rerun a few times, especially after key milestone, as I said, after any nearby pile driving or major earthwork, you probably go back and run the traverse and make sure that nothing has been moved or has been changed. Sometimes you will lose uh, one uh, line of sight between the control, uh, control station because there was some construction was in between them. So all these things can happen. Uh, just imagine you get the laser range finder and compass and then you will go out to the, uh, out to the field and then from PSM1 and PSM2 uh, you try to um, imagine we, I told you we need to have T1 and T4 uh, bridge control line that's for sure and the rest of them can be uh, approximately located where you want to put the other control surveys and it's diagram shows you the rough position of those control survey. Then what you need to do is just creating a table, have all the station names and then say from this station which station you are able to see like visibility if I'm going back on a slide. From PSM1 I can see station 1 and 2 only so I will list 2 and 1. Uh, you make sure that uh, you put something about ground stability because if something's going wrong then you know whether it was from the control mark which wasn't stable or maybe the ground has been moved so especially in earthwork uh, type of project is always uh, you're gonna have always earth movement that you have to consider 
We also have the sky element, which is more mainly for GNSS, that uh, if you want to use any GNSS observ uh, observation, whether we are able to use it or not. So you put some comments about uh, clear horizon in this case. You don't have any problem using the GNSS. And then you also put notes if there is any, like for example, uh, visibility is too far between the PSMs, like you can't really directly read from PSM1 to PSM2, so this note can, can be written in the field to help you to do the reconnaissance easier, rather than going to the field each time. You have all the information, then you're sitting in the office and do the pre-analysis. This is just an example of only PSM, and then this shows you the control station information. So it's pretty much repeating what we've had in the previous slide. So the next step is you need to consider what are the available resources for you to use. So I just made up Trumbo, like <laughs> uh, to just not, not having commercial use. Uh, just imagine we have a total station that uh, the shortest and longest range it can read is 3 meter to 2k and then distance precision is plus or minus 2 millimeter plus 3 ppm uh, horizontal angle pointing is 3 seconds remember I told you about the pointing if I'm measuring the angle and pointing to two points so each of them is 3 seconds so the Overall precision for the angle then would be squared 9918, so it's roughly 4 seconds. So just be careful about these things. So we assume our instrument is calibrated, very important. If your instrument is not calibrated, there's no point you do all these analysis. Then we also have GNSS receiver, uh, which specification is, uh, you can see that we can measure any baseline to this procedure, plus or minus two millimeter plus one ppm. Usually for any type, this type of work, we need to have the six hour observation at least. Uh, so, and the observation window is 120 degrees. So, as a software, you have access to Stonet, which uh, I've put the video how you can install the Stonet and use the demo version. Hopefully, uh, you can use that for this lesson. And I put also the folder of resources for this lesson specifically that you can use. Using the Compass Laser Range uh, Finder, hopefully knowing the coordinate for PSM 1 and 2, we worked it out the approximate coordinate of the proposed station from T1 to T4 uh, and then we fix the T1 to T4 to 90 degrees. I went through the standard for you. Uh, these are the screenshot I did that you can follow and then you can put it all the specification right in the project option. Then I'm going through the slide for this section. Uh, I decided I can show you in the software itself. So I prepared, so you can open this from the folder I put in the, on the study desk and then you can have a look at the data. So, so the first step is we have to go to the option project and look at some of the project option that we need to change. The first step is adjustment. We are running the adjustment to the adjustment. So we are choosing 2D here and then we are choosing the coordinate system. At the moment is UTM 56 South. Uh, uh, we can if obviously you want to if you want to use for example Australian version which is MGA you can come here uh, and change it to MGA 94 as well, 56 for us. So uh, just leave it as it is at the moment. It's just an example. I just used UTM. There's no reason for that, obviously. It's just uh, making up some numbers for coordinate. We go through the general tab. This is where you can choose uh, what your input looks like, whether you want to input east sync first and north sync, 
or you want how you're gonna uh, you want to input angle is for example on a station one reading from station two to three or you want to have from at two so these things can be changed at the moment I'm not gonna uh, you can also change the error propagation we leave it at 95 percent for most of our job we don't need to change it then instrument uh, specification, uh, as we know, uh, for distance measurement, we have 2 mm plus 3 ppm. For the total station we have at the moment, the angle, uh, as, as I said, was 3 seconds, but because it's only pointing, we have to work it out the angle precision, which in this case would be 4, direction and azimuth bearing, they're all 4 seconds. Uh, centering error is when you're Putting your instrument on target, you always have some error that uh, related to the try back of your instrument and try back of the target, and usually it's one mil to half a mil. Assuming that for this exercise we don't have any, so I put them as zero. Then I can move on to listening file. You can choose what you want to see uh, in the output data file. So I would choose observation residual, I want to see the coordinates like geodetic position, azimuth, and horizontal distances. You can untick and tick whatever you want to see at the moment. I ticked whatever I want to have. Then I went through this bit, so there's nothing else we need to change for this lesson. So I will hit OK. Then I'm going through some of the elements in the data file you have, you might have only one because I provided you with this one. I've created the, these two to save time and showing you the other option. So you have this one, you can go and from file, obviously open project, and then you can see this one under the lesson two resources, and then you can open it and you will see the screen same as the one I have here. So in the next few slides, I'm going through the data file elements and what are these means by each of them. So I've, I've explained the project options to you. Now the data file looks like something uh, like this, that you have your first section has your PSM, P1 and P2 are your PSM, which their coordinate coordinates is fixed when you have this sign it means that your coordinates are fixed and then traverse station of all the rest from T1 to T7 uh, we uh, get the coordinate approximately using as I said laser range finder and compass you might have more precise uh, method to get the estimation is totally uh, doesn't matter for this stage because it's just approximation and just want to work out the operation method, uh, method and also whether we can achieve the criteria or how many times probably we, read, we need to read the distance and angle to achieve that criteria. And then you can see I fixed the line P1 to T1 because we consider P1 is the PSM, so it's basically our backside. So I fix that line. When you put one exclamation, it means that it's fixed. But if you put question mark, it means that you haven't measured. So when the program runs the pre-analysis, it will calculate the P1 to T1 bearing itself. Then the next bit on the data file, it shows how your traverse is running. Your traverse is starting from T1, having backside to P1. As I said, we fix the P1 to T1 as uh, we fix the bearing. The B stands for bearing. And then we are starting from T1, going to T2, T3, T4, going to PSM2, T5, T6, T7, and we are coming back to T1 is basically beginning and end. So it's like a loop from T1 to itself. After that, you will see the section uh, that has 
started with M. M stands for measuring the distance and bearing. So when, whatever you have here, obviously it's in form of the angle. So it's like you have station P1. You want to do read to T1 and T4. I don't know whether it's scale my picture. I just want to show you. We measured the angle and we want to measure the distances for these two lines as well. So these measurements or observation are the observation that has not been included in the traverse. So for traverse, you usually go around the controls. If you have any measurement in between, you probably need to include them like the this one here, which we did. So obviously this is not a good drawing, but what I mean, like for middle observation, you have to insert them separately rather than having that as a traverse. And then uh, the next bit is from P2, like I'm at the station P2 for this one, reading T4 and T7. What it says is that it only measured angle. So this one is bearing and distance. this one angle only so my question is should I put it as M and measure the extra angles and distances obviously it would be an option if you can but for in this case if you measure the distance from P2 to C7 it's very large and is beyond the, our instrument uh, specifications so we can't really read that distance is uh, roughly than 2.3k which is uh, if you remember the longest side you can read using this uh, instrument is 2k so we can't really measure it that's why we have it as angle only the last part uh, defines what our ellipse uh, uh, we want to show in the network plot section uh, so the option I put is uh, rel uh, slash observation, which gives the relative error ellipse for the observation every or use the, you can even put it every as well, which gives you all the error ellipse for the point position and line combination. So it really depends on you which one you want to choose. Uh, both of them are very official what, informa what information we want to see or what error ellipse we want to see or examine. You might have different options as you can see here. You might put rel 1 to 2, 2 to 6, only show the error ellipse for this one. Or you want to put connect 1 to 7, uh, P1 and 6 it only shows the error ellipse for all combination of selection like anything with these points so you might change it and see how it looks like once you are happy with uh, your data file and you understand what it says then we can run the pre-analysis and examine the error ellipse from the results so if I'm going back, let's go back to the software and then try to see if I'm running the pre-analysis for this one. You might not see this one because I ran the pre-analysis before and it was here. If I um, then that's why I'm seeing that you might not see anything at the moment if you haven't run the pre-analysis yet. So you have to go to the run and then click on pre-analysis. And then you can see in the processing summary, you can see that it's been completed. If there is any error in your data file, it should show up here, like a blunder or a gross error, then it can do the pre-analysis for you and you have to fix it. At the moment everything looks fine, so I run and I can have a look at the error ellipse I have. First of all, you are looking for the error ellipse which is the largest one. If you look at the position only, you can see the position, error ellipse for position T7 is the largest one. So you have the 
P7 is probably can't meet our criteria or the error ellipse for that is uh, very large. You can see the error ellipse for T1, it looks like a red line. The reason for that is I've, I've fixed the azimuth between P1 and T1 so there is no error in azimuthal. If you kind of remember from what I told you uh, in the previous videos or lectures, if you are looking at error ellipse, this direction like perpendicular to your line is for azimuth. The one which is basically parallel or the, the axis, semi-axis of the ellipse which is in direction of your line gives you the error in distance. So you can see most of our line, um, like except uh, this one probably because T7 is not very good. Uh, most from what you can see in the error ellipse here is most of them are circular. It means that the error in distance are bearing are pretty much the same. So this is it. And you can also examine different options. Uh, we can turn them on and off to see like uh, more options. You can what you can do is I'm going back to so far you can come here and click on that and see the plot option you can choose whether you want to see the relative error, uh, error ellipse or not you can turn them on and off just see the relative error ellipse only or see the both position and relative so all these things can be changed through these settings here plot option Going back to our uh, slides, then as I said, you can examine that. Uh, you can also change the size of the text or size of the arrow ellipse to basically see them more clear. So, if they are, uh, so as I said, if your arrow ellipse are round, is basically your angle and distance are having a similar arrow. Conversely, if you have long narrow error ellipse, uh, then it means that uncertainty in, in direction uh, is uh, is larger than uncertainty in distance. So it would be the basically this case is probably the direction of the uh, error ellipse is more like if you have error ellipse, just say this one as you can see the uncertainty we don't have any error in the uh, even this one is looks like a line we don't have any uncertainty on the azimuth because we fixed that but we do have the uncertainty on the distance so uncertainty in one is more than the other one like distance and angle So once you are running the pre-analysis, you can go to output listing and see the output uh, of different arrows, coordinate, left and loss and everything. What output gives you, uh, the first section is usually uh, general settings of your instrument and file names where uh, you're going to save or the folder of the project and all those information that you have input into the software. The second bit is where you can see the instrument and standard uh, arrows that again you have input that and then the coordinates of the points and then the next one is basically the initial analysis uh, or pre-analysis report. Uh, let's have a look at this one for example. So you can see uh, it listed all the angles for me and then a standard Error related to that. The standard error you can see is based on the instrument specification which is 4 seconds and then you have these things small t to big t which is a correction to angle on the sphereoid but as you can see it's not significant here it's less than a second so it's not something that we are worried about. Then you have list of all distances again you have the standard error which have been calculated using the instrument specification that you have input into the software. You, because we fixed the P1 to T1, you can see 
uh, the azimuth has been calculated again based on the coordinates that you have input and because we consider that it's fixed there is no error associated with this one this is just an example of how the standard error for the distance has been calculated like for this distance t2 to t3 assuming is this one so the instrument specification was 2 mm plus 3 ppm so it is plus or minus 2 mm uh, 3 ppm times your distance is so it would be plus and minus 5.6 so, uh, having said that, we can say that standard deviations are at 68% confidence level. And same thing here, or 68% confidence level. But, uh, on the next page, you can see that when you're running pre-analysis, the software runs the adjustment, this is square adjustment for you and it gives you the adjusted azimuth and distance in this case based on your graded coordinates and this one here is a bit different. You can see all those standard deviations given at 95% confidence level for this one. So this is the standard deviation for azimuth, distance and you might say what's the PPM. You have to combine these two for the distance, obviously. For example, for line uh, P2 to T4, this one here, your uh, precision you can get using this is 16 millimeter plus 8 ppm, roughly. Good. Or this is another example P2 to T5 is 15.3 millimeter plus ppm and then you can convert it to plus 9 ppm and then you can convert it to the uh, ratio um, so remember this is 95 percent if you want to have 68 percent confidence level you can simply uh, divide it by two or in this case if i divide this ratio by two gives me one over two the, the last bit is the error propagation for all the stations so it's the adjusted code uh, it gives you the error, error for the adjusted coordinates you can see the largest error for uh, T7 and remember this is at 68% so the only part is just 95% is this one up there and then you have the uh, information about the error ellipse of the position as well as relative error ellipse which we've seen for the line if I have two position I always have error ellipse for the position and I might have error ellipse relative for this line which I said this direction is showing you azimuth or bearing error the direction of this axis gives you error for distance and you're at 95% confidence level. Back to our software, uh, I can run the pre we've run the pre-analysis, you can go to output listing or you can get the final results from file pre preview. I'm using print preview because it gives me better text to saw that um, I would like to have. So as I said, the first is about the project option settings and instrument standard error that you have inputted. Uh, data coordinates is basically angle and distances have been calculated based on your coordinates and the standard deviation error is based on the instrument specification. The azimuth that ha you have been uh, fixed for your adjustment and the list of um, azimuth and distances for the uh, between your points and for your control survey with their confidence uh, 
level of 95% for error in azimuth distance. So again, this is the relative error ellipse, this is the position error ellipse for each point, and this is showing you the standard deviation at 68% confidence level for the coordinates. So this is how it works in the software. Now we can go back to a uh, slide and what to look for is like, okay, I can see all those numbers, but what I really should do, what source of comparison I need to do, because there is no statistical test that I can see whether the adjustment, like if you are doing um, the adjustment, like complete adjustment, least square adjustment, you come with choice square. A uh, test which shows you whether it passed or not, then you can find out whether your geometry of the network and everything is alright or not. For this is not the case here. We can't really say uh, whether it's a good one or bad one. What you need to do is you work it out the obviously from each of those stations in your control survey. We can have the distance. We can get the sigma from a specification, so which is comes from. And then we have the sigma at 95% for the adjusted. And then we can convert it, obviously, if you divide it by 2, it's going to be 68% confidence level because a specification is based on 68% confidence level. And then I can calculate the difference between my adjusted uh, standard deviation and the one from a specification, then it shows the differences here. You can see the differences are uh, uh, very <coughs> small, like up to one mil. I will stop the video here and record the rest in the next video.